Good to have you here, Larry. He, he was great. He is great. Okay, well, that was the first thing I was going to ask you since you're here, and he just spoke. I saw you kind of giving him a nice congratulatory pat there as he walked by in the uh, curtain hallway. Uh, what do you think about that, what he was just saying? Well, I would divide it into two parts, the vaccines and then the food additives. Um, you know, the major cause of childhood blindness is something called xerophthalmia. It's a vitamin A deficiency. And uh, Al Summer, who was the dean of Johns Hopkins, figured out how to add vitamin A to rice. And by doing that, he's almost wiped out one of the major causes of uh, childhood blindness. So that's a precedent for this. It's a precedent. Yeah. Um, as is iodizing salt, right. uh, because it eliminates goiter which you had a great deal of in Nepal and other places. So I love the idea. He's totally right about uh, iron deficiency anemia. And one of the major causes of it is men ignoring the fact that women have periods and don't do anything about the blood loss that, that due to, uh, to the hemorrhages that, that often occur. So I think he's on the right track. I really Good. liked it. I didn't fully introduce you. It's hard to introduce you because you've done so many things. Um, I'm old. No, but it's not just that you're old. You've used those years fairly well, if I might say. Um, you, you, you were sort of like a hippie doctor. You, I, the thing I forgot, what, how did you get to medical school at some point in there, right? You were a hippie, right? Are you doubting it? Yeah, kind of. I mean, you went to, you were, when you were in India and the Steve Jobs stuff, which I do want to get to, were you already a doctor then? Yeah. So you kind of went to medical school, and despite, well, I guess in those days, you didn't owe like half a million dollars coming out of medical school. Right. So you just went to an ashram to be with your guru for a while. Yes. And but was in between that, um, uh, how many of you are from the Bay Area? Do you remember when a group of Native Americans took over Alcatraz? And there was a baby born on that island? Yeah. I, I was the, the doc who helped deliver that, and I lived on that island for about six weeks. This guy, I mean, there's like so many stories like that. You're gonna be, you're gonna be amazed. You're gonna wish this wasn't 25 minutes. Okay, so. And then when I got off the island, uh, there was a guy from Warner Brothers there who asked me if I wanted to play a young doctor in a Warner Brothers movie. Is that true? It is true. Or as my father would say, it had the additional incremental benefit of being true. <laughs> and um, my wife and I joined a, a caravan to make a horrible movie called The Great Medicine Ball Caravan, uh, which was about the Grateful Dead and a bunch of hippies. And so I met Wavy Gravy, and I joined the hog farm and hung out with Ken Kesey and wound up acting in this movie. And we got on these buses, and we uh, took them as far as uh, Glastonbury, we had to change buses at the big ocean. And we liked it so much, we bought a couple more buses, and we drove from Glastonbury to Kathmandu. That took about two years. Wow. That was and, pretty wonderful. And that, was it on that same trip you ended up going to the ashram in mm -hmm. India? Mm -hmm. You just sort of detoured down into India from, from Nepal? Well, we had wanted to go to East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, because there had been a cyclone there and a million people had died. And we, we fitted our buses with uh, medical supplies and food, and we were on our way, and then the Civil War broke out, and East Pakistan and West Pakistan didn't get along very well. And so we couldn't get to East Pakistan, so we made a left turn and went to Kathmandu. Okay, now talk about, so you had this period when you were you know, a devote, devoted follower of a very inspiring guru, and he inspired you then to basically go into healthcare Public, public, uh, uh, what's the, what's the, public health. Yeah, public health. Sorry. So, uh, talk about that. We didn't inspire me. He told me to. Okay. Well, that's a kind of form of inspiration. He, of. he actually, he, you know, I would sit there and I would meditate, and he would throw apples at my testicles and say, "You should get out of the ashram." Did he really do that literally? Literally. That he, must have hurt. He had a very good aim. Did, he did. That would get you to public health really fast. Well, I, so he told me I, sh I should go down to the World Health Organization office in New Delhi and get a job uh, helping to eradicate smallpox because this was God's gift to humanity. Um, and so I went to WHO, took about 17 hours of a train and a bus, and I went into WHO, and of course they kicked me out because I was wearing this white dress. <laughs> and I had hair down to the middle of my back, and I had a big beard. 
So I went back up and I saw my guru, his name was Neem Karoli Baba. Uh, for those of you who know Ram Das, that's the same guru. And he, uh, he said to me, did you get your job? And I said, no, he said, go back. <laughs> and I went back 17 hours and of course they kicked me out again and rinse and repeat about 12 times, but I got smart. I trimmed the beard, I lost the dress, I put on a suit and tie, and I walked in, and that's when I thought you were gonna ask about did I really go to medical school, because I walked in to the WHO office and there was this tall American, and he said, are you American, who are you? I said, I'm a doctor. He said, okay, why are you here? And I said, well, my guru who lives in the Himalayas told me that I was supposed to come work for WHO and help eradicate smallpox. What do you do? I said, well, I'm the head of the global smallpox eradication program. We don't have a smallpox eradication program in India. But since we're here, maybe I could interview you. Well, that was a fortuitous coincidence. And 10 years later, when he sent me back that was to why turn you had the to lights do it off, what? 10 years later, he sent me back to turn the lights off on the program. Uh, and I found the interview notes that he had done of me. He said, I have today interviewed a young man uh, named Dr. Brilliant, improbable name, and he says he's a doctor, doesn't look like one. I would never hire him. And he had hired me and I became the head of the program, but it took 10 years. And you did more or less eradicate smallpox. With 150,000 of the most wonderful, courageous people in the world. Yeah, it's and the only disease ever eradicated. But you pretty much led that program. No, I, I you actually- were one of the leaders. I actually came in on the tail end. I was more the mascot. Okay, well, you were a good mascot. I was a good mascot. Even without the beard? It, you know, like, you heard what happened to that guy, uh, what was his name, Samson? Doesn't, didn't work out well for him. Wait, who, which one? The guy who lost his oh, hair. Oh, Samson. Samson. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I don't know what to ask. There's so many ways to go, but since we're there in that WHO office in India. Just quickly tell that Steve Jobs story, will you? So uh, a, a lot of the people who came to uh, meet uh, Neem Karoli Baba came from all over the world, and Steve was one of them. Um, he had uh, just dropped out of Reed. He was trying to find his way like many of us. Uh, you know, I mentioned that trip going through Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, going into India living in the Himalayas. That was the regular career path in the 1960s. <laughs> I mean, no, nothing really unusual about that. So he- Quite a few people were, uh, uh, of, you know. You know, uh, so he- White middle he, class he, Americans did that. Yeah, so he did the same thing, but it took him a little while to get his shit together. And uh, he, he wound up coming about six months after my teacher had died. But there was no such thing as email. He didn't know it, he got there. He shaved his head, he was walking around barefoot, and I think after a while he was hungry. The, the two things you really want if you're a young Westerner in India and you're going from guru to guru and ashram to ashram is number one, you want air conditioning, and number two, you want a salad. Thank you. I know, the, the, the Grand Prix seems to be outside I'll take tonight. that, you know. So um, he came to to find the one place in India he could find air conditioning and a salad, which was the World Health Organization building. And he came in and he went up to the front desk, Mrs. Edna Boyer, who was the receptionist, and he said, um, I've come to meet Dr. Larry Brilliant. Could you, is he here? And she called me and she said, Larry, there's a dirty hippie here. He's barefoot. He, he, he looks terrible. In fact, he reminds me just like you when you first came here. <laughs> he wants to meet you. So I went down and I, I, I hung out with him, but all he really wanted was a salad and air conditioning. Okay, and you did become lifelong friends and you That's have true. helped each other a lot over the years. Um, you also, let's just go to the present, just take a leap. You also co-founded The Well with Stuart Brand, and you know, okay, that's a nice one. But you- um, <laughs> No advertising. You are CN one of CNN's COVID analysts, right? And you have done an enormous amount of research and communication around the pandemic. Um, so, you know, we talked, we called this, the 
global health and global warming, what's the connection? Let's go to that, and what, what is the connection, particularly when it comes to pandemics? I think the major connection is that the antecedent causes of climate change and global warming are many of the same antecedent causes of pandemics. Um, if you think about, uh, as the Earth gets warmer, animals from the south are migrating to the north. Mosquitoes are able to increase their, their reign. Over a billion more people are at risk of malaria right now because the Anopheles mosquito can now breed at higher latitudes and greater, uh, at, at higher altitudes and greater latitudes. Um, as animals from the south go and meet other animals like them, the same species, in the north they carry the same viruses and they, uh, We've now all learned all about variants, recombination. Well, that's exactly what they do. So we're having a tremendous amount of spillover because the, uh, fo the forests, the rainforests are being clear cut. Uh, if you saw the movie Contagion, how many of you saw the movie Contagion? So I was the science advisor on that movie, and we tried to make a movie that would be a, um, a, a, a fictional representation of what we thought would really happen. We didn't expect to get it so close, uh. but the whole idea of a bat with a virus entering into the human environment, which is what happened with COVID, and with SARS, and probably with MERS, and with Ebola, that process is the same fundamental process that's causing global warming and causing climate change. How so? Well, we use fossil fuels. Uh, the fossil fuels create greenhouse gases. You get global warming. And from that, you, you, you wind up changing the way water works, salt works, the entire ecosystem of the planet. And animals and humans are now living in each other's territory. Uh, last year, bushmeat, wild animals were consumed by both ends of the economic spectrum. Um, in the poorer communities, people in Africa are eating monkeys because they don't have enough food to buy, enough money to buy food. And on the wealthy side, we're keeping monkeys and uh, what, are, what are called giant Gambian pouched rodents as pets. That led to the last monkeypox outbreak in Minnesota. Um, from a pet? From a pet, from a pet rat. They're very good, by the way, at smelling out landmines, but they're not so good because they, they brought monkeypox into the United States. So we're, we're finding the same issue that you find causes climate change also causes spillover. And spillover is occurring now at five times the rate that it did 50 years ago. So every year, one, two, or three new novel diseases that have never seen human beings are spilling over and we're getting exposed to them. Um, there's a lot of other linkages too. When you think of famine, drought, you think of um, salt. Those are the things to think about. And, and why water and salt? Um, I was privileged to see the last case of variola major, the last case of smallpox in nature in the world. A little girl named Rahima Banu in a, in a village called Karalia on an island called Bola Island in Bangladesh. Mm. And when she coughed, a metaphysical moment took place that the virus landed on the soil in Bangladesh and was cooked by the hot Bengali sun. That was the end of an unbroken chain of transmission going all the way back to Pharaoh Ramses V. Wow. In the 19th century, in the 20th century, more people died of smallpox than any other infectious diseases. In the 20th century, half a billion people died of smallpox. When that little girl coughed, when her scabs fell off, that was the end of the worst disease in history. And for those of us who worked to help eradicate smallpox, it was, I, I can't even explain it to you, but the, of course it did a lot more for us than we ever did for the world. But it, it felt so wonderful to be able to participate in something like that, that over the next 40 years, many of us wanted to go back on a pilgrimage to that village to see that girl, but we couldn't go there because it's underwater, mm. because almost half of Bola Island is underwater. And much of Bola Island that's not underwater 
is filled with salt from the ocean spilling over, and salt kills agricultural land. So now you can see how all these things are tied together. Global warming, increased drought, increased floods, increased putting salt in the earth. I, I don't know if you know this, but the word uh, salary, as in being paid your money, when the Roman troops that sacked Carthage were paid, they were paid with something called salarium argentum, which means getting your silver as salt because salt was such a precious commodity. And after they had been victorious, they decided they never wanted Carthage to ever fight the Roman legions again. So they salted the lands so they would never again rise up an army. And, and salt kills living things. So the biggest thing that we see in the world of global health, one of the biggest things, is that as water levels rise, they bring with it salt and we lose agricultural, and that means that climate change can lead to famine. It leads to the world not being able to uh, feed ourselves. And all of these things at the same time reduce animal habitat, put animals and humans in each other's habitat. And that's why we've gotten over the last 10 years a cacophony of these viruses. Now you've heard them, SARS and MERS and Ebola. West Nile disease, Lyme disease, and now you've had COVID, and you've had all the different variants. We've all gotten to know what a subvariant is. Um, these are all part of the same process. The major culprit is modernity. The most invasive species in the world is us. We're the ones that are putting the world at such ecological risk, and with it, we will find challenges to our food, challenges to our water, challenges to agriculture, and challenges to pandemics as well. Jeez. Um, you wanted me to end today on an upbeat. No, uh, you, you probably still will, I would predict. <laughs> but but um, so uh, you also are very worried about COVID variants right now. Could you just tell us why? Well, I how many people are here? What do we have, about 120? 120, 120 maybe. Yeah. So probably one out of 20 of you are now carrying COVID, SARS-CoV-2. Didn't move away from me. I've got my mask. I know. You were the only one wearing a mask in that room. But it's this because device. there's probably four people in this have... room who are infectious with COVID, and I don't want to get it. I also don't want to give it if I happen to be one of those four people. Um, Right now, I think we're in a, in a uh, funny stage with this disease. Um, three years ago, I wrote an article in Foreign Affairs called The Forever Virus. And people got mad at me because they were saying, well, we're all done with it, and they wanted to move on. I hope that's true. We may actually be there right now. There are four coronaviruses that preceded this one that retired into the retirement home of coronaviruses, which means they became colds. That's right. Half of the colds that you get are coronaviruses, and they are related to SARS-CoV-2. It may be that that's the process that this virus is going through now, and I pray to God that it is. But we've also got five really terrible new subvariants. Each one is more infectious than the other. All of them are a bit mysterious in terms of how much disease they'll cause. And right now, we're playing a whack-a-mole game with new vaccines that have a little bit more effectiveness in stopping you from getting it, but a great effectiveness in stopping you from getting dead, but we're fighting the battle of the last variant. So I don't know where it's going to go. I All wish these sub-variants are in different parts of the world, right? They are. Yeah. Uh, we've got about 25% of all the uh, cases of COVID today in Marin County, which is where I live, that are in the BQQ family, and there are four of those, and those are the ones that we worry about the most. There's several new sub-variants that have all spun off BA5. I know everybody's conversant with all this code now, which I suppose is a good thing. I wish you didn't have to learn it. Did, did you see this announcement? Moderna said that their, their pan, pan, whatever it is. Hybrid. But the new booster that, that I happily got before reading this article. Muzzle tough. Um, was much more effective with 
variants than had been anticipated or something like that? Was it exactly? I think in fairness, I would say it's marginally more effective than the original formulation against the BA5. Of course, we have no idea against these BQQ variants because we haven't had them around yet. But that's not why you get it. Unfortunately, the, these vaccines do not give you very much protection against getting infected. They give you phenomenal protection against getting sick. And they give you almost 99% uh, effectiveness against getting dead, which is really good. a good thing. Good. I think we should allow you all to interact with Larry if you are inclined to do so. Um, I guess nobody is. OK. Uh, oh, somebody? I cannot see because there's such bright lights. Hi. Um, I'm supposed to pick the questioners. You know that, Kendall. Did you know that? You knew that. But um, if it's him, it's okay. But he has asked a lot of questions. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, last question, I promise. Uh, Naveen Kunde, Clorox Company. We've worked a lot with the Cleveland Clinic um, on the virome and the you know and so on the last couple of years, and um, one connection that um, with global warming that we were told about was that uh, with the ice cap melting viruses that were sort of buried with a lot of human populations that died centuries ago uh, from viruses are now being exhumed and getting back into the atmosphere. Can Whoa. you comment on that? Is that right? I mean, it, uh, it's how we found out that the 1918 pandemic, which we've been calling the Spanish flu, that it was actually caused by H1N1, swine flu because Jeff Tautenberg found a corpse that had been frozen uh, in Alaska and was able to uh, exhume the virus from it and reconstruct it. But that virus was not uh, capable of infecting others. I would say it was not alive, but viruses are never alive, so that's not much help. But it was not able to infect people. And I doubt very much that we'll be finding viruses that have survived those conditions and that are able to infect you. Now, if you were talking about funguses, some bacterias, um, anthrax, for example, um, I would worry more about it than that. But I think right now our bigger problem is just us, the, the terrible way in which we've dealt with COVID-19. Every country has done a terrible job. No country has done a great job. Um, we shouldn't be in the position we're in right now where somewhere between 5 and 15 million people have died of this disease at a time when modern medicine is so much greater than it was in 1918. What the hell are we doing now competing with the death rates that we had from a disease 100 years ago when we've got better hospitals, better treatment? Um, those are the bigger worries I have right now. Um, I do worry about the new variants, but I'm also very happy that two-thirds of Americans have had COVID, Two-thirds of Americans have had three doses of the vaccine, but only 8% eight of, 8 of us have had the new hybrid uh, vaccine that you had. You're top of the class again, David. I just have get every shot that I could to be protected from this ridiculous virus. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that you did, and it's not really, maybe it is because you ran into Steve Jobs way back when you were 23 or whatever, 25, but you somehow got involved in the tech industry along the way. We didn't mention till now that he ran Google.org for a very critical period. And when it, did you start it? Did you? You were the founding director. Well, the, the founders were Larry and Sergey. Yeah, but they you were the first money. person I, to I be the Google.org. I gave the money person. away. Right. And, and Google.org is, was I right earlier in saying that it was partly inspired by Salesforce having done something similar? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the agreement that they had to give away $2 billion, uh, that came from them. But uh, they, we, 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 um, we shamelessly stole Benioff's model of 1% 1, 1 of uh, equity, 1% of sales rev revenue, and 1% of uh, uh, employees' time. Well, a good person to steal from. Um, Very good person to steal from. So the theme of our conference is innovation must save the world. And you, uh, you know, you're an ex-hippie doctor, WHO, smallpox expert, COVID oh, expert, guy. who lives in you know, San Francisco and knows tons of tech people. When you hear that, do you think innovation is going to help us save the world? Uh, I don't know if you heard Esther talk yesterday, last night, when she said, what makes us think that all innovation is going to be good? There's a lot of innovations that have been pretty terrible. Nuclear weapons are an innovation that haven't really worked out that well. Yeah. Um, I hope so. 
I hope that innovation is going to make a big difference. Um, you know, as I see what happened in the, the fight against COVID, the ability to take mRNA technology and work on it for years as DARPA did, and then have it ready to convert it into vaccines so quickly, save, you know, millions and millions of lives. So thank God for that. But the innovations that we really need, well, you were talking about at the end of yesterday when you were talking about a total change in human consciousness, about compassion, about altruism, about stopping to think of the other people as others. Um, if, if we don't do that, then Moderna is going to fail, as I think it failed in this instance, to help make proximate manufacturing so that we could get vaccines in South Africa to protect South Africa from having the pandemic that they had, which may have led to the creation of these variants, because one of the major ways that variants are cooked up is in immunocompromised people who keep the virus going for eight, nine, 10 months. And South Africa did, didn't have any vaccines. If Moderna had a little bit more um, altruism, self enlightened self-interest, they would have helped make manufacturing plants all over the world. Right, and there was a moment when that was being considered, wasn't and, it? And, yeah. and I think they failed that test. Yeah. And so when I think of innovation, I think of the software, not in the case of our software, but in the infrastructure of how we allocate resources and the decisions that we make. You mentioned uh, Mark Benioff, and you compared the V2 mom to OKRs. I'd like to just... She, you know, and Clara did, but yeah. She, so I, I was on the board of, of, of uh, Salesforce.org for 15 years. And V2 mom, which is vision and values, and then the mom is almost like OKRs, objectives and key results. By the way, if you haven't read John Doerr's book, uh, Scale and Speed, speed, speed and by scale, all yeah. means read it. It's, it's a wonderful application of OKRs as a management principle to climate change. So, but, but what, Mark, what Mark Benioff does is he adds the values and the vision. I think in order to have innovations that are really gonna have enduring value, help bridge the gap between the rich and the poor, do equitable redistribution of the resources that we need to make the world a better place, we ought to focus on the V and the V, the vision okay. and the values. Part. I got I to gotta hope, I'm going to try to have you end on a positive note. Isn't uh, that positive? Yeah, that was. Values, vision. Right. That's but I, I got to follow up. We, we're out of time, and we're going to have to get to the buses soon for dinner. But maybe we need innovation in religion. What do you think of that? How many days do we have to talk about that? <laughs> but what do you think? Is, would, you, would you think, after five days of discussion, would you kind of say maybe yes, or? Well, you know, I, I lived in a monastery for a long time, and I spent uh, three years studying Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity, Judaism, Islam. I, I find a tremendous amount of wisdom from the great religions. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the practitioners are always right. Um, it's hard to look at the Christian nationalists and, and think that Jesus would recognize them today. Um, so I think that the goals of religion, the moral teachings of religion are wonderful, and uh, it'd be wonderful if we could follow them. Let's figure out a way to innovate there. Anyway, you are an amazing person and a wonderful, it's a gift to have you come and help us end the day. So thank you, Larry. Thank you. You're a good friend. Yeah.